Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Stephen Downs. I work with the National Research Council of Canada, um, based in Ottawa, Canada. We've been working on online learning and e-learning applications since about 2001. Topic for today is a distributed content addressable network for open educational resources. I'm going to proceed in two parts. The first part will sketch open educational resources and some of the problems being faced by them today. Second part will propose the solution, which I'm calling uh, content addressable resources for education or care. So to begin with the problem, the open web began decades ago as email lists and Usenet groups sharing just happened between people. I think of people like, for example, Larry Lipman. If people had a question to ask him, he simply answered the question. It was just free and open sharing on the internet. With the arrival of the World Wide Web, we got personal websites, we got blogs, we got uh, message boards like Yahoo Groups, which are now closing. Um, and the open web thrived in an age of social networks, in an age of online classes, and more recently, massive open online courses. The idea of open education is reflected in the early internet and the openness of the early internet is reflected in the concept of open education. Open education began through organizations like the Open University as access to learning without barriers to admission. And over time it grew to include access to education without any barriers at all, including financial barriers or social barriers. And over time it became a philosophy about the way people should produce, share, and build on knowledge with openness being the facilitator to knowledge exchange and the creation of webs of knowledge, similar to what we just saw in the previous uh, presentation. Related to that, open educational resources were defined in 2001 by UNESCO as teaching, learning, and research materials that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost, use, adaptation, access, and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. Since that definition, there have been tens of thousands, maybe millions of open educational resources produced around the world and stored in open educational resource repositories. One of the major applications of open educational resources was the massive open online course. The first of these was developed in 2008. It was called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge, kind of a niche subject, but even so it still attracted more than 2,000 people. The original MOOC was based on the idea of open education and open educational resources. It was created out of open educational resources and the way the course was constructed was that these resources were linked together. They were created by or found by participants in the course, linked together and then shared with the participants of the course. The design of the original MOOCs was to create a course that was essentially a web or a graph of linked open data, not just course materials and not just subject areas or concepts, but all of the aspects of an online course, events, skills, modules, activities, resources, etc. All linked together and all interoperating in this open environment. The idea of open education is essentially to create not just access to educational resources, but to create a pedagogy of engagement. 
open educational resources allow students to participate in the selection of the resources and the evaluation of the resources for suitability and for their own purposes. The use of open educational resources by virtue of this selection process inherently involves discussion and interpretation. Each student in a course, especially in a massive open online course, comes to the course with a different perspective, a different point of view, based on the resources that they've accessed and based, of course, on their own background and experience. And in a course based on open educational resources, content creation is as important as consumption. Students participate in the creation of new resources and in the teaching of the course with and among each other. This has resulted in a philosophy of open pedagogy, and here I'm drawing on Canol and Hagerty. They've put, put up a list of a number of characteristics of open pedagogy, participation, trust, innovation, sharing of resources, connected community, learner-generated concept, reflective practice, and peer review. And we see all of these implemented and instantiated to one degree or another in most massive open online courses. However, there has been a pushback against openness on the web in general and against open educational resources in particular. On the web in general, we see things like vendors requiring payment for access to resources. Every, so often, every, every time you go to a content site these days, it's like pay $5 a month for access. Um, vendors have also been making money through advertising. And both of these together, the subscription payments and the advertising, have resulted in a model of the web which is built around content silos where these silos monetize themselves by basically creating a surveillance network. So your behavior can be tracked and analyzed and used as a vehicle for advertising a promotion. We see this not just on newspaper and, and uh, blog websites, but even well, these days especially in social networks such as Facebook and Twitter and all the uh, social ills that have resulted from that. There are additional challenges facing open educational resources in particular. Uh, MOOC providers such as Coursera and Udacity and uh, OpenLearn have begun to create barriers to access. First, by charging money for certification. Second, by charging money for access to the content itself. This has been happening in the world of open educational resources, resource repositories. For example, Flat World Knowledge started charging money for access to open educational resources. And there are ongoing issues of sustainability. Uh, it costs a lot to create a repository, to curate that repository, and to manage access and distribution of open educational resources. Further, there has been a movement toward the enclosure of open educational resources, uh, basically taking resources that were contributed by people for free with the intent of distributing them for free use and access for exchange and interchange among students and participants, taking these resources and commodifying them and enclosing them in commercial websites so that you have to either have paid tuition or paid a subscription fee in order to access and use these resources that used to be free. Finally, there are application issues for open educational resources. Uh, studies have found limited reuse of them. Licensing remains a mystery to many people. Uh, it's not easy to create and upload open educational resources to repositories. Uh, they remain hard to discover despite content recommendation services like we saw in our talk earlier today. They're still hard for people to find and use. Um, individual 
OER often lacked educational support materials, and there isn't really a good mechanism for ensuring the quality of open educational resources. So, we propose care, content, addressable resources for education as a solution to some, although not necessarily all, of these issues. We begin with the idea of content distribution networks. This is something that has become widespread on the web as we know it today, where content is stored not on a single centralized server, but rather on multiple servers located around the world, such that when a user requests web content, it is obtained from the nearest server rather than from the originating server. Companies such as Cloudflare and Akamai now serve, according to studies, as much as half of all traffic on the World Wide Web. And it makes sense, right? Why not get your content from a server located, say, here in Sardinia, or at least in Italy, instead of getting it from a server located in North America? Related to that is the distributed web, which is similar to content distribution networks, except the content, instead of residing on a commercial web server, resides on individuals' computers. So if you're using the internet, you can use uh, an application to distribute content as well as to consume content. There have been numerous developments of this idea over the, year, over the years. Uh, Napster, for example, which was used to <laughs> illegally distribute music, Nutella, Tor, BitTorrent, and others have been developed over the years, enabling individual computers to make it easier and faster to access large bodies of web content. These are called peers, and a system designed in this way is known as a peer-to-peer -peer network. The idea of decentralization addresses, at least in theory, many of the problems that we've seen in the original web. Um, it solves, or addresses at least, problems of traffic where large servers might be overwhelmed by many requests, or conversely, in order to address many requests, you have to build larger and larger and therefore more expensive web servers. Uh, it also solves issues of latency, sitting there and waiting for something to come around halfway around the world for you to view it. It also addresses issues of national policies where content may be available in one form in one country and a different form in another country. And it reduces the reliance on a centralized source of content such that if the centralized source goes down, a distributed web still makes it possible to access web content from your local server. More recently, there have been developments around a concept known as Web3, corresponding to a JavaScript library of the same name. It basically takes the idea of the distributed peer-to-peer -peer web and in so doing, change encrypted data structures together to create what might be called to create what might be called a stateful distributed web. It's very much the same as the peer-to-peer -peer web, but now these contents are linked together so that when you put some content on the web, you can know whether or not it has changed. The most obvious of these in recent years has been uh, blockchain networks such as Bitcoin or Ethereum or Ripple or others where transactions are the entities that have been linked together using encryption. So I really don't get 40 minutes, eh? Well, I can only follow the instructions I think. Yes. Um, but beyond obvious applications such as distributed token networks such as Bitcoin and Ethereum, Web3 may also offer a response to issues of centralization and commercialization affecting open educational resources. For example, we're using a mechanism of content addressing. The content of a resource can be input into a hash algorithm to produce a unique string or hash that stands for the content of that resource. Each 
hash, therefore, is a unique identifier for the resource. In such a case, a peer can send a request to the closest peer to it, requesting the resource by the hash address rather than by the location of the resource. Here's an example of content addressing where the input for different inputs, we get different output digests or output hashes, as they're sometimes called. So in content addressing, the content of the resource is used to create the hash algorithm. Each algorithm is the unique identifier, and the peer sends a request for that identifier. One significant implementation of this is called DWeb for distributed web, it's based on something called the DAT protocol. And that DAT address that you see is the address of the first uh, content addressable resource for education. Now I tested it in this system, but DWeb requests are being blocked here in, in this university. Which is one of the problems with the distributed web at this point in time. So these peer applications run on your own computer and access the distributed web. One example of these is the Beaker browser. It allows you to access these resources, to clone them, to edit them in place in the Beaker browser, and then to upload those to the distributed web. So what we're doing here is basically creating this web of interrelated resources that are stored on this distributed web. We can call that CareNet. Other applications, of course, blockchain, which I mentioned. Uh, GitHub uh, is based on a protocol very similar to that underlying DAT. They're both based on what are called Merkle chains or Merkle graphs, which are connections of interlinked resources linked with cryptographic links between them and the interplanetary file system, which is what we used for CARE, also uh, along with interplanetary linked data. So we have content addressable resources for education. They're content addressable. They're stored and accessible on the web as a whole. They're associated with each other in what might be called an open resource graph, and CARE can be cloned and edited by any user. An example of the sort of resource that could be cloned and shared is found in Jupyter Notebooks. Now, Jupyter Notebooks are a completely separate system. However, if you take a notebook created in Jupyter Notebooks, which can be edited and run as software by a user, and store that and share that in a distributed web, then your notebook can be distributed, adapted, and shared by people as an open educational resource. The implementation of CARE is through interplanetary file system. The resources are uploaded into IPFS, and then to maintain integrity and to link resources together, the address is stored on the Ethereum blockchain network. So, we can store in this way not just you know content, videos, multimedia, but also full applications and service interfaces as well. And what's important here is care can be cloned and edited by any user. Putting it in IPFS basically makes it impossible for commercial providers to enclose it or to charge access, charge money for access to it. So here's how we implemented. CareNet at NRC. As you can see, we used a Node Express application in order to upload the resource, store it on IPFS or alternatively on GitHub, then register the address of the resource on Ethereum so that we can search through Ethereum in order to find the resource. This is the software that was implemented by our summer student. You'll be able to get that link when you see these slides later. And this is the result of an implementation of CARE where we've uploaded a file, stored the address in blockchain, and stored the resource itself in IPFS. Now there are still issues for CARE. It's not fast yet because the entire distributed web is not fast yet. 
It's still not easy to use. Uh, there still isn't a good D-Web search engine. And as I saw in testing here today, uh, many institutions still do not allow peer-to-peer -peer applications, or even, as it turns out, um, SSH applications to run in their environment. Future work, well, we'll address the speed issue for care. We'll address multi-part care resources, which we call care packages, and we'll develop mechanisms for content creation through remixing and reusing existing resources. That's my presentation, and I thank you for your time and your patience. So, yeah, the, the question was, what of the safety of the open educational resources? Um, so, because we use uh, a hash addressing mechanism, there's a unique hash address produced for each resource. But what that means is, when we retrieve the resource, we can ensure that we're getting exactly the resource that we asked for by taking the resource and running it through the hash algorithm again. And that verifies the integrity of the resource because the output of a hash algorithm that we run the second time would have to match the address. So we're always sure of getting exactly the resource that we ask for. Additionally, there are mechanisms, and there are mentioned, some of them were mentioned in an earlier presentation, that allow for resources to be signed and for this signature to be linked to the resource itself, again using a cryptographic hashing function. You take the signature, the resource, and you combine the two and use that as your hash. And so that ensures the integrity of authorship of the resource. Sure, yeah. Maybe I didn't understand it all, but what I'm wondering is that why would anyone give any material for this system? Because it seems to me that then it's out of your control. Yes, it is out of your control. So, so I mean, that's a different, it's, I mean, there are two different attitudes about this, right? Um, there's the attitude of, the material must always be under my control, or there's the attitude of, I want to make this material available for sharing so that nobody else can make it under their control, right? Uh, the people who want to control their material, there are many ways to do that, right? What there is not is a good way to share material in such a way that you know it will continue to be shareable. Right. right now, the only mechanism is licensing, and licensing is really imperfect. So this is a technological solution that instead of relying on licensing, we rely on a distributed web and content-based addressing to make it impossible to control the resource. So it's for people who want to share. If you don't want to share, do something else. Of course you can. Yeah, it's uh, you have material. It's just like on GitHub, right? Uh, GitHub uses a mechanism that's very similar, right? You have a piece of software in GitHub. Uh, you write a patch to it, or or you know, or you might you know, another person might put in a pull request. There are all kinds of ways. The original doesn't go away, but the resources are like stacked so that there's a chain of resources back to the original. Same, you know, it's the same kind of mechanism that Wikipedia uses, except Wikipedia uses a different addressing scheme, but still, you can always edit a Wikipedia page. The originals always remain in place, and the new version is just linked to the old version. You have a chain of resources. They can, they can take your material and make a change to it 
but now that becomes their new resource. They don't change your actual resource, but they make a derivative version of your resource. No. That's right. Yeah, because because your paper contains a reference back to my paper as part of the original code of your paper. Maybe I missed this already. I missed this, but is this already run? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> okay. All of the pieces that I talked about are running. IPF is running, DAT is running, Beaker Browser is running. The code that I showed you is running, right? But it's only being run by one or two people. But so it, it all exists, it all works, uh, but this is still very much in the future. Thank you very much.